Abraham Lincoln once said that the ballot is more powerful than the bullet. And I cannot agree with him more. It is always the people's mandate that speaks. And that is the best aspect of our nation, the freedom to vote that our people have. Why do we deny this freedom, this fundamental right, to such a large, active segment of our population, however? I'm speaking of our 16 to 17 year old youth that many of us have labeled as the future of our society. If we are to drive our communities, our cities, provinces, and nation forwards, we need the voice of our future in the elections. Ladies and gentlemen, guests and fellow cadets, we need to reduce the voting age from 18 to 16. And it's not like no country's ever done this before. There are seven nations with a voting age of 16 and another six with that of 17. Canada has a wealth of resources and data to go off of. And it cannot go wrong by taking this monumental step. I understand that many of you are likely worried about our maturity level at this stage, but this perceived lack of maturity can be thwarted if we allow the younger end of our population to vote slightly earlier. Counterintuitive? Hear me out. The naked truth is, 18 is a horrible age to start voting. Just think about it. You've just left your home for the first time and are going to university, college, or whatever other path you've chosen and are struggling to make ends meet. May it be paying your rent, your tuition, or maintaining your grades. And on top of that, you're expected to vote in the upcoming election in an unfamiliar, insecure situation. It's like juggling three things at once. Now, if we allow our 16-year-olds to vote, they'll be doing so at a time where they have the leisure to make the right, informed decision within the ballot box, while preparing themselves for the future. Studies have shown that if someone votes in one election, they are more than likely to vote in the next one which means that our students will continue voting at 17, 18, 19, and beyond. Thus, we are preparing our youth to be engaged, active citizens of the future. My question is this, however. If 16-year-olds can work, enlist in the military as juniors and shoot a gun, drive a car at 100 kilometers an hour down the highway, or marry with parental consent. And I don't endorse the last one, by the way. <laughs> Why can't they vote? If the government deems us responsible and intelligent enough to pay our taxes, why can't we have a say in how that money is spent? Does it not concern us how the education system is run? After all, at 16, we do still go to school. And you may think that we shouldn't have a voice but there are 16-year-olds who are successful entrepreneurs who are running their own companies, aren't at the forefront of innovation and change in their communities. Do they not deserve a voice? Should they have to wait two years in order to be heard? I myself am 16 years old and have been involved in civic affairs since I was 13 when I served as a legislative page. There are countless others like me who have the passion and interest to make the right, informed decision within the ballot box. Should we all have to wait two years in order to be heard? I mean, sure, I admit it. Sometimes we forget to do our dishes, or we might be lagging behind in our homework. But come on, cut us some slack. We understand the importance and gravity of voting, and will exercise our right effectively. And for those of us that do not have the necessary passion or interest at this stage, we can change that. Initiatives such as Student Vote and Seminars for First-Time Voters can change this perceived lack of knowledge for the better. The bottom line is, voting isn't a privilege. It's a right. However, this right is currently denied for a key segment of our population. Our 16 to 17 year old youth have been able to achieve extraordinary things that have awed everyone. 
and they are more than deserving to vote and exercise a right long overdue. By taking this step, society will come closer to being a more equal, inclusive one that cares for the rights of all of its citizens, especially those that can work, enlist in the military, drive a car, or marry with parental consent. Let's break the stigma and system of immaturity and exclusion and allow our 16 to 17 year old youth to vote. Our generation is becoming so busy trying to prove that women can do everything a man can do that women are losing their uniqueness. Women weren't created to do everything a man can do. They were created to do everything a man can't do. <laughs> After all, the first horror novel was written about a man who, does, who tried to do something a, man, a woman does, and we all saw how that went. Thank you, Mary Shelley, for Frankenstein. Judges, offer, officers, and fellow human beings, I am Warrant Officer Second Class Courtney Sinclair, and I'm going to be talking about why gender equality is important for today's youth. Imagine going to the store and having to pay more for things like deodorant, razors, even pens can be more expensive just because they're pink and labeled as for women. I don't know how many of you dry clean your clothes, but it is still more expensive to dry clean a woman's blouse, even though they are typically smaller than a man's shirt. Not only that, but there is an added tax on things we need, such as sanitary napkins. These are just some of the glaring differences between being a man and being a woman. It's hard enough being a teenager without the added pressure of worrying about how much basic toiletries cost because manufacturers have decided to take advantage of the difference between the sexes. On top of having to pay more for things, according to the most recent Statistics Canada report done in 2017, the gender wage cap in Canada still exists. Women aged 15 and older are only earning 87 cents for every dollar a man makes. Think about it, that was only two years ago. I don't think much has changed since then. The, Uni the United Nations Development Program says that women, and young women in particular, face structural discrimination due to the patriarchal nature of most societies. <coughs> young women are often amongst the most marginalized, vulnerable, and if they live in rural or remote areas or particular human sediments, the hardest to reach young people. Young women make up nearly half the world's population, yet are regularly prevented from accessing basic services and decent employment. Unleashing the potential of girls and young women is an effective pathway to addressing poverty, improving access to health, education, and sanitation. Making societies more inclusive and reducing violence in community. Half the world's population is untapped potential. Think of how much better the world could be if we empowered our women. Gender inequality affects more than just Canada. All over the world, women are being denied access to education and, ba and the basic human rights we enjoy here, such as the right to vote. Our world's youth are the leaders of tomorrow, and if they are denied education, they may never reach their full potential. Change starts with us. We can make all the laws we want, but if our attitude never changes, nothing will ever improve. We need to recognize the wrong that has been done and teach our children so that they may never make the same mistakes we have. Just as reading and writing are taught, we can teach our children love and compassion. Our young women could be the next astronauts, engineers, or politicians, but if we do not teach them that they can, they might never be. We need to teach our boys that women are more than just objects, that they can be just as smart as them, and that they deserve respect. We need to teach our girls that it is okay to take up space to speak and be heard. 
Too long have people in this country and the world been treated differently because of things that they have no control over. We are all people and that should be all that matters. The song Ceasefire by Four King and Country says, how can we change a life by pointing fingers? When blame is the truth we are preaching and lies are what we, were, we are believing, no one ever wins when the goal is to settle the score. <coughs> Privileged men need to realize what they have, but they should not be persecuted for it. If all men or all women are in power, things are off balance. We need equality, not one is better than the other. There are many programs designed to promote change. Emma Watson's He For She campaign is a good example of this. But Cadets is also a program that is influencing change. One of the teaching points of the Cadet program is to empower. And I am so thankful for that because Cadets has taught me many things. How to be heard through this competition, through instructing classes, and just by teaching me how to be a good leader in everyday life. Empowering today's young men and women is the best way to reach a future where this doesn't need to be discussed. And that is why gender equality is important not only for today's youth, but for all of society. Limitless. This is the first word that comes to my mind when I think of 3D printer technology. Our world is being silently remodeled before our eyes. The demand for factory production is rapidly decreasing, product design is only stressed by our imagination, and we have the ability to create almost anything with just the push of a button. Honored judges, guests, and fellow competitors, I am Sergeant Hamilton, and today I will be speaking to you about 3D printer technology and our future. 3D printing is accomplished by building a solid object slice by slice. These micro-thin layers stick to one another and eventually, from bottom up, create a solid object. Now, the inks that these printers use can be basically anything. Metals, nylons, thermoplastics, even live human cells. And the possibilities are endless. These printers can create anything from airplane parts to human bones to houses and buildings. Even a real life, 100% edible, homemade pizza. 3D printing is revolutionizing our world one product at a time and is not decelerating anytime soon. Predominantly, I would like to touch on how 3D printers are altering and shaping the future of education. By integrating this technology into both the minds and classrooms of students, we are doing our futures a favor. With the ability to print out almost any object, lessons in schools are shifting to become much more tactile, technology-based, and physically interactive. This new technology will also force learning to become more STEM-based and will most definitely spark students' design skills and promote creativity. For example, history teachers now have the ability to print out bones, fossils, and artifacts for their lessons. By incorporating these 3D printed materials into our education system, we will be promoting kinesthetic learning, as physically creating our course content will allow for a deeper understanding of our lessons. Now validated by studies, the majority of students do flourish through learning kinesthetically. Learning in this type of environment allows students to work within their comfort zones, demonstrate their confidence levels, and dive deeper into their creative abilities. As once said by Joyce Mayer, potential is a priceless treasure, like gold. We all have gold hidden within us, we just have to dig to get it out. Receiving education through 3D printing allows us to do just this, discover our true potential. Time to kiss the good old pen and paper goodbye. Furthermore, I would like to discuss the advances in the world of medicine due to the rise in 3D printing. 3D bioprinting is already in effect using bio inks and biomaterials to create human tissue, skin, and bones. This is an extremely monumental advance in the world of medicine as organ transplant waiting lists are being shortened and patients are being granted easier access to the organs that they require. Not only are patients almost guaranteed a transplant, but the process is significantly more reliable and effective. And this is because doctors and engineers are working together to craft organs for these patients using that individual's own DNA. Even one year ago, if a patient were to have a severe heart attack, the obvious procedure would to be considered receiving a heart transplant. Today, however, using 3D printer technology and reprogrammed stem cells, that patient is able to have their heart repaired rather than replaced. 
The breakthroughs in the world of medicine are nothing less than amazing. Miniature kidneys have already been successfully 3D printed and transferred to human bodies. Skin and bones have also been printed and tissues have been synthesized. Families that were once torn apart by devastating circumstances are now offered solace by this advancement. Organ transplant waiting lists are being terminated and patients are being granted the gift of life. Prosthetics are also in the process of being created and improved by engineers and physicians. With the ability to print out prosthetics, amputees are able, are able to have them completely customized to fit them and to accommodate them to the highest possible degree. Not only does 3D printing have the ability to change a patient's life, it has the ability to save a patient's life. Lastly, our current means of construction and building design will be altered for the better. The current conventional and, ma and manufactured building methods that we're utilizing today will be soon replaced by 3D printer technology. By the year 2030, NASA will be using 3D printed rocket parts to construct the spacecrafts that will be responsible for transporting humans to Mars. By the same year, 2030, the Dubai government is aiming to have a colossal 25% of its new buildings be 3D printed. Even one year ago, a 3D printed city would have seemed like a sci-fi novel concept. But today, this miraculous city is under construction as I speak. The use of construction, the use of 3D printing in construction ensures that products will be made exactly as they are intended to, as the genius printers create exactly what they are told to. By being able to print out materials, we will also see a substantial reduction in the cost of production and labor, as well as the benefit of the reduction of material waste, as only the necessary materials will be used when constructing goods. With these up and coming 3D printed rockets launching into the galaxy and these endless toy skyscrapers poking through the clouds, I fail to agree with the familiar saying, the sky's the limit. The sky is not the limit when we have 3D printed rockets waiting to launch into the solar system. The sky is not the limit when we have ink built buildings towering above cities. The only limit to this technology is our imagination. If we can dream it, we can build it. Overall, it is indisputable that 3D printing is changing our world and fabricating our future one brick, one fossil, one kidney at a time. Will it be a bright future? Well, now that you and I have the key to the world of imagination, it is up to us to remember. We are not here to fear our future. We are here to create it. In 1950, a three-minute phone call from Boston to London cost $12. That price dropped to $3 in the 1960s, but when minimum wage was a mere 85 cents per hour, you would have to save up a week's worth of earnings to have a 30-minute conversation with your grandmother. Today, I can pick up a PC International long-distance calling card, and I only get charged 4.9 cents a minute to call almost anyone, anywhere on Earth. By 2010, FaceTime was invented, and you no longer even needed to call your grandparents because they could easily figure out how to FaceTime you themselves. The evolution of technology has clearly enhanced communication, so why are people saying otherwise? See, this morning, I walked past a good dozen people who didn't even look up from their phones to say good morning. My friend could text me from the other room using the laughing crying emoji and communicate more than her flat facial expression. Good evening, honorable judges, fellow cadets, ladies and gentlemen. I am Sergeant Liu, and today I want you to know that technology creates a lack of emotion, productivity, and integrity in earnest, quality, and truthful communication. Don't you think it's ironic how, while technology was supposed to improve communication, it has created such deep gaps within it instead? The lack of emotion that technology creates in earnest communication makes it really manipulative. With so many social media networks, everything is based on data, market demand, and popularity. Two weeks into 2019, a simple viral photo of an egg surpassed Kylie Jenner's record for the most liked picture on Instagram, which is a photo of an actual human being with her actual human baby. That egg also beat out Justin Bieber's engagement photo to Haley Baldwin, Beyonce's pregnancy announcement, and Kim Kardashian's wedding photo with Kanye. All these photos are iconic shots that communicate the wholesomeness of humanity, but not as iconic as one brown egg, apparently. That egg definitely did not get all those likes out of the goodness of people's hearts, so it really shows how with technology and its ability to spread content rapidly, 
Society selects the things they want based on their popularity and virality, not principle and merit. What is communicated is not always in earnest, because technology is reducing the love and emotions in good people, which is crucial to communication without gaps. Today, many of us don't have the time to communicate to others without meaning. And because of technology, meaning no longer means an emotional connection, but rather the reputation that it can provide. Furthermore, technology creates a lack of productivity and quality communication. With the constant emergence of new internet slang and abbreviations, it can be really hard for some to keep up. The other day, after watching a basketball game at school, my friend pointed over to this really tall and athletic looking guy and said, that guy was the GOAT, wasn't he? I had never heard of the term GOAT used in this context ever, and I was beyond confused. So I just kind of smiled and nodded. It wasn't until after I got home that day that I googled what GOAT meant and figured that it stood for the greatest of all time. See, if my friend had only said greatest of all time and not GOAT, which would have taken maybe two seconds longer to say, I would have been able to receive the message he was trying to communicate a lot faster. Communication is garbled rather than clarified when an abbreviation used is unfamiliar to someone. So our tendency to implement this internet slang in day-to-day -day life creates more gaps in communication than necessary. Moreover, technology creates a lack of trust and integrity in communication. Behind a screen, I can be anyone I want and say anything I desire because technology makes it really easy to lie. Say I was going to a party Sunday night in a warehouse on the outskirts of town. I'd get there with a friend first. Then, when my parents ask me where I am through text, I can easily just say that I'm at the library studying for that big math exam I have on Monday. If I had to tell this to my parents face to face, my face would probably flush bright red as I tell the lie, but through a screen, the lie comes rather easily. But how long is it going to take for my parents to realize that I've been lying all along, and how long is it going to take for them to trust me ever again? Trust takes years to build, but only a moment to break, and technology makes this really easy. Technology removes the high standard of truthful communication, and without integrity behind a screen, there are too many gaps in communication that make it truthless. Technology was supposed to enhance communication, but instead, it has created such deep gaps within it. The lack of emotion, productivity, and integrity that it creates in earnest, quality, and truthful communication really prove how technology is influencing our day-to-day -day behaviors and beliefs. Behind a screen, what you think does not have to be what you say, and what you say does not have to be what you do, because with technology as a filter and as an excuse, no one would ever know about the lack of consistency between your thoughts, your words, and your actions. As American management consultant Peter Drucker once said, the most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said. So I challenge all of you to look up from your phones today and listen to the richness of earnest, quality, and truthful communication. Close your eyes for a second and imagine this, a world without technology. Go on, no smart car, no phone, no TV, no laptop. How do you feel? Now imagine a world with no people but you did have a phone, Wi-Fi, and a charger, of course. How do you feel now? Parents, fellow cadets, officers, and esteemed judges, my name is Flight Corporal Bonnie Dutta, and well, I'm no psychology expert, but I can guess that in both scenarios, you felt confused and alone. People and technology are both things we've lived with for basically our entire lives. So taking either away would be unfamiliar. We all have people we care about. However, our world is rapidly losing the ability to communicate with those we love. Spoken words and actual conversations are being replaced with text messages and emails. And if our world keeps heading in this direction, soon enough, people won't know how to actually have a proper verbal conversation. People are losing the skill of conversation. They don't understand how to properly conduct themselves in public. 
too many. Everything in life is virtual. Parents and children are no longer communicating frequently. As in the past, children only had toys, TV, and friends as distractions. However, now, phones and the internet have posed themselves as even bigger distractions, leading to less meaningful parent-child interaction. And this isn't only applicable in a parent-child scenario. Spending time with friends has become sit around on your phone and text. We're talking to each other less and less. And it's funny, because two people on two different sides of the world can communicate via Skype or FaceTime. Group chats and email threads have made it possible for multiple people to share ideas no matter where they are in the world. Sentences of thoughts can be reduced to simple LOLs and Ks. We no longer need to express true emotion. Emojis do that for us. So why go see a friend? You can just FaceTime them instead, right? It's practically the same thing, right? I don't think so. Face-to-face -face conversation, it's irreplaceable. However, our world seems to be doing its best to make sure it hardly ever happens anymore. Have you ever sat down to eat with someone and pulled your phone out? My thought when I see that is there is a live person in front of you. Talk to them. And when that doesn't happen, the person across the table simply pulls their phone out too. And just like that, with a snap of your fingers, time that is supposed to be spent with loved ones is simply more screen time. In today's day and age, you can learn all about a person by simply clicking on their social media profile. You can become best friends with someone without ever truly speaking. The fact is, many people use social media to put forward the best aspects of their lives, creating this fake reality, this ideal image this perfect world. So when you become friends with someone over social media, you're getting to know a completely different person than the one sitting behind that screen. You think you're making a friend when really you're distancing yourself from your real friends. Every moment you spend living your virtual life is a moment spent living a life alone. We are distancing ourselves from the rest of the world, and technology is to blame. While we are able to stay connected, we're losing the ability to hold a conversation. Our attention spans are becoming shorter and shorter, and without us even realizing it, we're becoming lazier and lonelier. Multiple studies have shown that since cell phones became popular and frequently used, anxiety and depression rates have skyrocketed. One hour a day turns into two hours a day, to three, to four, to five, and this keeps going until we have no time for anyone else. Our society is fighting to stay in communication. However, technology is making it difficult to achieve that one thing we're fighting for. Understand that I don't think technology is all bad. It lets us stay in touch with those we don't get to see often because of our crazy busy lives. However, we must be wary. If we don't consciously remind ourselves to talk to those around us, soon the only thing we will truly be in touch with is our phones. Think about that. I know I don't want to live in a world where someone would rather be friends with my social media profiles than with me. Technology is causing a massive gap in day-to-day -day communications. However, that gap will only widen if we let it. So put that phone away. Thank you. Nearly 50 years ago, half a billion people watched in awe on their televisions as the most daring feat in human history was about to be accomplished. On July 20th, uh, at 10.56 p.m. in 1969, President Neil Armstrong climbed down the ladder of the Eagle Lander and became the first person to set foot on the surface of the moon. The words he spoke as he reached the bottom truly put into perspective just how important this milestone was to the world. That's one small step for man, 
one giant leap for mankind. Ladies, gentlemen, and fellow cadets, have you ever wondered why haven't we returned to the moon? If it's been 47 years since man last set foot there, what's stopping us from returning? We have the technology to go back. Apollo 11 did it in 1969 with a computer less powerful than an iPhone. The truth is that with the Cold War long over and with the technology today to send a robotic probe virtually anywhere in the solar system, why would we bother sending humans? In the 1960s to 70s, the American government spent billions of dollars of taxpayers' money on the Apollo missions. But with the Cold War and the space race between the US and the Soviet Union at its height, the American people embraced the idea as it was a sense of national pride. Since the end of the Cold War, robotic spacecraft have been used to explore the farthest depths of the solar system. These spacecraft are capable of achieving amazing things, all without the need for food, water, or oxygen. They come at a much more reasonable price, and they can be better justified because of ethics issues surrounding strapping a human on top of an 160 million horsepower rocket and shooting him into space at 32 times the speed of sound. Up until recent years, using robotic spacecraft has seemed like the better option, but that point of view is beginning to change within the scientific community and throughout societies around the world. With manned missions to Mars within the next few decades a very real possibility, there is a good chance that the moon could become a training ground for NASA as they prepare for their next milestone in space exploration. Thirty years ago, living in space was mere science fiction, but today astronauts routinely live and work for months at a time aboard the International Space Station. The same living conditions aboard the International Space Station could be created in lunar outposts on the moon's surface. Similar in size to polar research stations in the Antarctic, these structures could house ast astronauts for long durations as they live and train for future missions to the Red Planet. In the event of a serious problem or disaster aboard a manned mission to the moon, the moon would only be a few days of travel away opposed to months of travel with Mars. The moon's close proximity to Earth would make it a good place to carry out training missions in an environment similar to Mars while being almost 55 million kilometers closer to home. Outside of preparing for future Mars missions, the lunar surface could provide us with many technological breakthroughs. For example, radio telescopes could be placed on the far side of the moon and operate far better because they are shielded from the static of Earth's aurora. Smaller telescopes could also be placed on the lunar surface and connect to form interferometer arrays, essentially an extremely powerful space imaging system, which would rival the largest telescopes of today. Outside of astronomy, the moon has a variety of rare minerals which could be mined and used by humans. One of these minerals is helium-3, which is an extremely rare isotope here on Earth that exists in large quantities in lunar soil. If thermonuclear fusion is produced for energy here on Earth, helium-3 could be very useful for the reactors as it does not cause the reactor to emit radiation and cause harm to humans. A more practical use of helium-3 is to use it to create rare medical isotopes, which currently can only be created in cyclotrons. Research suggests that by using these helium-3 reactors, these rare medical isotopes could be created in hospitals. Altogether, helium-3 would be very useful to us here on Earth if we can find a way to mine it and transport it here in large quantities. Although sending robotic spacecraft to the moon would be much easier, sending humans is the only way to accomplish tasks such as space technology projects, surface mining, and training for future missions to Mars. After all, the Apollo missions were never meant to be easy to begin with. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy unveiled a speech to the public about the Apollo missions. He said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that, that challenge will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that goal is one which we are willing to accept, one which we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. As the final Apollo mission, Apollo 17, prepared to leave the lunar surface, astronaut Eugene Cernan announced to ground control that we leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return, with peace and hope for all mankind. I think that it is time for us to fulfill that remark and return to the moon. It's the only way that we can achieve the dream of reaching Mars. And as we know from the Apollo missions, when we dare to dream, 
we can achieve the impossible. Sometimes, in order to find the true value of what's important, you have to look on the inside. Good afternoon, judges, officers, guests, and my fellow cadets. I am Sergeant Knight Abbey. When preparing my speech for this year's competition, I had to make one of the hardest decisions I have ever made in my life. And that was choosing a topic to talk about. All the subjects intrigued me. All of the discussions opened up a world of potential and possibility. Despite this, I had one distinct topic catch my eye. A topic, or a question rather, that I only really considered when I stopped and asked myself something important. My topic for this year is why am I an air cadet? Now, if you were asking me this question before, I would know what, how to answer. I would say, air cadets is something I love. It's something I've been doing for almost four years now. At this point, it's a part of me. I wouldn't be the person that I am today without cadets. Yet after repeatedly being asked by my peers why I'm so fond of the program, I realized the true answer was something much more complex and something that I've known all along. In this speech, I will start by sharing a, stor a short story of how I first came to know of the Air Cadet program. Then I will move on to share the two fundamental reasons to why I believe I enjoy Air Cadets them being the vast number of teams and activities the program has to offer, and most importantly, the friendships and bonds Air Cadets creates. With all that being said, let's get started. On a dull spring afternoon, just weeks after my 12th birthday, my father came up to me and presented me with information that within an instant transformed my dull, eventless day into a sensational one. Now my dad loves aviation. He always told me how flying my own plane could easily be one of the best experiences of a lifetime. So that day, when my father came up to me and suggested that I join Air Cadets, I agreed without an ounce of hesitation. One of the reasons why I just adore the Air Cadet program is the vast number of teams and activities the program has to offer. For example, if a cadet is looking to improve their self-discipline and perfect their uniform, then the drill team with or without arms always shows the best results. Through drill team alone, a cadet's drill, dress, and deportment can improve drastically. Not only that, but Air Cadets also offers the effective speaking program where cadets have a chance to speak on topics they are proud and passionate about to their respected peers and judges. From Air Cadets' concise drill team members to its articulate public speakers and more, the cadet program has something to offer for just about everybody. However, I believe that the most important reason to why I enjoy Air Cadets is the vast number of friendships and bonds Air Cadets creates for you. Last summer, I attended the Basic Aviation Technology and Aerospace course in CTC Trenton. During this course, I got to grow my knowledge on space and aviation technology with other like-minded cadets from across Ontario. By the end of the course, the cadets in my flight felt like we had known each other for years, when in reality, it had only been 21 days. Then, there are the individual squadrons. An Air Cadet squadron can be compared to your family. The cadets in your squadron are people that you spend years with. Together, you spend time growing, learning, and truly becoming the people of tomorrow. 
Your squadron is always there to cheer you on when you doubt you can achieve something. It congratulates you with more enthusiasm than anyone else when you accomplish your goals. At the end of the day, the details of why I am in the Air Cadet program are not very different from many other cadets. I would say that this topic is so important, seeing that the type of opportunity that Air Cadets gives you is like no other. The Air Cadet experience is something I enjoy every moment of. When I lace up my boots, button up my tunic, and proudly place my wedge on my head, I am no longer just an ordinary school student. I am something much more grand, more invigorating, more unique. I am an Air Cadet. And that feeling alone, that feeling of being a part of something extraordinary is enough to make anyone yearn to come back for more. Whether it be the countless teams and activities Air Cadets has to offer, or the friendships and bonds that Cadets creates, there is something I can say for sure. And that is if I could go back to that dull spring afternoon, when I was first offered the opportunity to join Air Cadets, I wouldn't be able to say yes fast enough. There is no such thing as a model or ideal Canadian. What could be more absurd than the concept of an all-Canadian boy or girl? A country which emphasizes uniformity is one which creates intolerance and hate. A country which eulogizes the average citizen is one which breeds mediocrity. Those are the words of former Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Consider them for a minute. Because across this nation, 37 million people are able to say with certainty and pride, I am Canadian. But actually trying to define that phrase is another matter. If you were to fly from Vancouver to Montreal to Iqaluit to St. John's, you would experience four completely different cultures and hear four completely different languages. English, French, Inuktitut, and Nufi. And that's not even an exhaustive list of the ways to experience Canada. But every part of it is equally and authentically Canadian. What is it, then, that unites the people of this country? Well, I love maple syrup. I also think poutine is fantastic. However, I'd be lying through my teeth if I said I enjoyed Tim Horton's coffee, or that hockey is my favorite sport. Clearly, what unites us as Canadians isn't our taste in food or our hobbies, but our shared values, those of equality, diversity, kindness, respect, and hard work. This basic moral code is at the foundations of our society, and that is what makes Canada a truly great country to live in. Which brings me to my next point. To be Canadian is also to be incredibly privileged. People come to Canada from all over the world seeking better opportunities, and it's easy to see why. We're ranked 10th in the world by GDP and 9th on the World Happiness Index. We have a democratic government which provides universal health care, public education, and countless other services. And not only do we defend peace and justice on our own soil, but we work with our allies to defend these values internationally. For those of us already living in Canada, this can be easy to take for granted. But there are many countries in the world where this is not the reality. That is why, as Canadians, we should continue to be grateful for everything our country has to offer us. Now, it's clear that Canadians can be described both in terms of what we have and in terms of what we value. However, there is another factor which has described us since before we were even a nation. Canadians are not Americans. From the War of 1812 to the rapid construction of the Canadian Pacific Railway to our independent foreign policies in World War II and the Cold War, we have proven time and time again our ability to make decisions independent of our more powerful neighbor to the south. That is why Canadians can take pride in having our own unique culture and heritage. Finally, 
One of the most important aspects of being Canadian is our ability to acknowledge our past mistakes. We take great pride in many parts of our history, but we're also critical of our past failures, and this is because we hold ourselves to a high moral standard. This is the reason why you will hear more and more discussion of Canada's residential school system. It's also the motivation behind the newly released print of the $10 bill, which features Viola Desmond, a black Canadian civil rights icon, as well as the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and lines from the Charter of Rights and Freedoms proclaiming equality for all. Our ability as Canadians to apologize, not just superficially, but where it counts, is incredibly important because only once we do that can we cease to be defined by our past mistakes and instead come to be known for our efforts to correct them. After all that I've said, I hope it's clear to see that what unites the people of Canada from coast to coast to coast is the fact that we can all claim the Canadian identity, regardless of our differences. As Pierre Trudeau concluded, what the world should be seeking and what we as Canadians must continue to cherish are not concepts of uniformity, but human values, compassion, love, and understanding. That is perhaps the most accurate description of what it means to be Canadian. We do not ask citizens to fit a single mold, but instead take what each of us has to offer, our unique backgrounds, personalities, and experiences, and combine that with the values we share. That is how we come to truly understand each other and the country we live in, and how we continue to develop our ever-expanding definition of what it means to be Canadian. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm LAC Potke from the 547 Canuck Squadron. And today, I'm going to be talking about about cannabis and how it's going to affect our youth. Recently, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, legalized cannabis. A lot of people are concerned about this affecting our, our youth. Well, they're not wrong. It's going to affect our youth 100%. Throughout this speech, I will be talking about recreational marijuana and not medical marijuana because medical marijuana saves lives, unlike recreational marijuana where people can put whatever they want in it and it'll it can ruin a life. First of all, to begin, I've been seeing a lot more commercials about don't don't smoke and drive and don't dr don't drive drunk and yeah. Um, sorry about that. This could affect our future for the youth by think by making them think that smoking is smoking and driving is worse than drinking and driving, although they, they're both equally bad and should be put in the same commercial to send out equal message. Secondly, I would like to talk about how youths are affected by secondhand smoke, or secondhand high. This mainly happens in apartments or conjointed buildings. This happens by, let's just say, your neighbor smokes up and it'll travel through the ventilation system, get to your room. If you have kids they're and they inhale that, they can get sick. Or, my next point, it can, it can damage their brain. I've read on an official Canadian governmental website that your brain does not, mat does not finish maturing until you reach the age of 25 years old. And marijuana affects a part of your brain that allows you to make judgment. So let's just say, let's just say um, in the future, when you're younger, you smoked up and now you lack judgment. Now you're in the future and you don't, you don't know how to come across certain situations. So you're making bad decisions and you could be behind bars and it's just not a Prison isn't a good thing at all. Um, I'd like to also make the point that K 
cannabis is very expensive, so with, and taxes are going up, and food, like food taxes are going up too. And when kids smoke cannabis, they, they crave lots of food. And, well, we already do, because we're a bunch of teenagers, we're a bunch of goblins. Um, we, when you smoke marijuana, you, you get the munchies, so you're gonna be spending all your money on food that you do not need, and what's gonna happen to your, to your college money, your university money? It's not gonna be there because you decided to make bad decisions and what's left? You're just gonna be stuck on the side of the road or living with your parents still. Smoke, uh, smoking cannabis is a gateway drug. If you're at a party, someone offers you a joint, you're gonna, you're, you can say no, or you can be the cool kid and say, yeah, sure, why not? It's not gonna hurt. You're gonna smoke it, you're gonna get, you're gonna get intoxicated, and then someone's gonna offer you a more dangerous drug like cocaine, and you're gonna be like, you're not gonna have the judgment to say, say no you're gonna say yes, because you think, oh, it's not gonna hurt me, why not? And then you're gonna do it, you're gonna wake up in the next morning realizing you just ruined your life and now you're addicted to a drug that you didn't even want to try in the first place. Elderly, um, elderly people want to retire from their jobs, but they can't retire unless the youth take over their jobs for them, but how are they going to do that if they don't have that money to pay for, pay for college or university? I also believe that the elders might lose hope on us because of this action we're going to take. To conclude, I believe that the use of cannabis will affect our, our youth. You need Strong-willed, proud, brave, creative, inspiring. Those all come to mind when I think of what a Canadian is, and there are so many reasons to why they come to mind. Let's go back in time for a minute. It's 1914, and World War I is just starting. The Canadian military forces need more troops, more soldiers. Tons of proud Canadian men go out of their homes and they voluntarily risk their lives to fight in the World War, in World War I and to represent their country. When we really think about it, Canadians fought in many of the biggest battles. They fought in Vimy Ridge, which was the battle where France had lost their town of Vimy to, to the Germans. and they were having a hard time fighting against them. So they thought, let's get our allies to help. These proud Canadians will help us and will help us reach our goal. And that's what they did. And the Canadians helped them and got back their town of Vimy. Then, in the last 100 days of World War I, D-Day had started. And tens of thousands of Canadian troops were waiting patiently to risk their lives and headed straight to the battle. They weren't scared. They were proud and they were ready to go. Then we think brave. Who else comes to mind than Nellie McClung and the Famous Five? Nellie McClung and the Famous Five were a group of women who wanted to end non-equality for women. And in 1916, Nellie McClung and the Famous Five got Canadians Canadian women the right to vote in Manitoba, making Manitoba the first Canadian province and even the first province to have for a woman to be able to vote and have a say in our legal system. Then we go on to creative and inspirational. We think artists like Emily Carr, the group of seven, and even music artists like Gord Downey. The group of seven were a group of seven artists who had a different style in their time. 
Their art wasn't as realistic as others before them. Their art was more cartoonish and creative and even more interesting. But in their town, they didn't, want, they didn't like change. They didn't accept the change of creativity that they were bringing. So what did they do? They went to different towns across Ontario or even Canada and different towns were accepting their arts, their different style. And sooner or later, Emily Carr came into the picture. Emily Carr was, she isolated herself from the, the community until 1927. She had her first art exhibit with 20 of her paintings. There, at that exhibit, she met the group of seven, which at that time, they were skyrocketing with their new different style and everyone was just so interested in it. Sooner or later, Emily Carr became a part of the group of seven, becoming the first and last woman to join them. Then we go into music artists like Gord Downey. He had a unique style, a different style, a very creative style of, her, of bringing in the awareness of residential schools and giving people the idea to, let's just open up and talk about it. It's part of our past that we need to just accept. So with his album, The Secret Path, based on the book, The Secret Path, who, that book was based on Channing Wen Jack who was a kid who was sent to the residential school who ran away and froze to death. With that, Gord Downing thought, let's just keep going. Gord Downing was the lead, center, lead singer of the group The Tragically Hip, which had a different and unique style. With their creativity, the world loved their music. Then, when we think Strongwood, who else would come to mind then, no other than Terry Fox? Diagnosed it with cancer at a young age and having to have one of his legs amputated, Terry Fox started to have a dream and an idea to start something to bring awareness to cancer. He started his journey on the Marathon of Hope. With that, he raised over $500 million for cancer research and showed Canadians that cancer is a real problem. So in all, when we think of what a Canadian is, we think brave like the Canadian soldiers and proud. We think brave like Nellie McClung. We think strong willed like Terry Fox and creative like all the different artists. Good afternoon, judges, fellow cadets, and welcomed guests. I am Warrant Officer First Class Rebecca Frederick from 704 Air Force City Squadron. If you were to go back about five and a half years and tell me that I would one day have the privilege of introducing myself to you, as I just did, I would probably never believe you. Ladies and gentlemen, today I'm here to talk to you about life as a cadet, and more specifically about how being a cadet has helped me grow into the person I am today. Before I begin, there are a few things I think you should know about me. First of all, I joined cadets a year late, making me 13 years old rather than 12. Second, to put it simply, I was shy, quiet, and anxious. However, that's a bit of an understatement. And third, actually, that's about it. I was pretty much just shy and old. Anyway, I'd like to begin by taking it way back in time to September 9th, 2013, the day I first became an air cadet. It all started at breakfast when my mom brought up the reoccurring question to which I had never really given a straight answer. So, honey, the air cadets meet on the base tonight. Do you think we should go down there and check it out? As I said before, I never really gave her a straight answer. So I guess she took matters into her own hands and decided that yes, we would be going down there to check it out. When we arrived, all of the other cadets were outside on the parade square, having social time to catch up with one another after the summer holidays. My parents tried to make me feel better by saying things like, oh, it doesn't look too bad, and I don't see anyone doing push-ups. It didn't really help, though. Soon enough, a lady in a uniform appeared to collect the new cadets and take them for an orientation. Now, to my 13-year-old self, 
This officer seemed very intimidating, kind of like the ones you see in the movies. They soon had a sergeant, at the time the highest ranking female cadet, give us a speech about how cadets had helped her overcome her shyness. She then took us to meet our flight commander, a flight corporal who told us that we could go to her or any of the other flight corporals for anything we needed. Now at this moment, I wanted nothing more than to go home and cry. However, deep down inside somewhere, there was a tiny voice saying, wow, I can't wait to be a flight corporal so that I'm the one that gets to help all the new cadets. Little did I know that someday I would do just that and more. However, this thought was soon replaced with fear as we were taken to meet all the other cadets. This was the first of many difficult times for me during my first year. I was sitting by myself, shaking and fighting back the tears because I was just so afraid to talk to anyone there. Luckily, it wasn't long before the sergeant who had given the speech came and sat with me because she noticed I was alone. We talked for a bit and she introduced me to a few of the other girls there, one of which is now still one of my best friends to this day. At this point, I still was trying not to cry, but fortunately, I was able to save it until the car ride home. That's not all though. I also woke up the next morning and bawled for another hour and insisted I would never go back. I, w I would later come to thank my mom for telling me that I had to give it till Christmas. So I reluctantly scraped through the next few months, not to say I cried at every event, but I cried at every event. <laughs> my first FTX, my first vigil, the night I got my uniform, you name it, I cried at it. As you can probably conclude, I've come a very long way since then. By no means was it easy, but am I ever glad I didn't quit. Over the past five and a half years, I've done things I never dreamed were possible for me. This past summer, I had the privilege of taking glider. As a young cadet, I was always encouraged by staff to take ground school so that I would one day be able to apply for this course. However, it took me a few years to decide I actually wanted to try, as I never thought I would have what it takes to complete such a challenging program. My hard work proved me wrong. This summer, I was the first of 70 cadets to fly solo. I couldn't name a time I felt more empowered by the things I can do. Not only did I learn how to fly, but I learned that I have the ability to inspire myself and others to do the things we view as impossible. I've also had the incredible opportunity to be a warrant officer at my squadron for the past two years. During this time, I've learned communication and leadership skills as well as gained the confidence to put them into action. I went from not having the courage to even say hi to anyone to commanding my entire squadron on parade in front of an audience full of friends and family. I went from needing someone to come and sit with me when I was alone to being that someone that goes and sits with others when they're alone and facing challenges similar to the ones I once faced. My time as an air cadet has taught me to always persevere through any challenges I face in order to overcome them and that I am capable of anything I put my mind to. I am forever grateful for all that the program has done for me. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to say that I am Warrant Officer First Class Rebecca Frederick from 704 Air Force City Squadron. Good afternoon. This topic is one that is close to my heart. I am going to be speaking to you on the subject of what is a Canadian. What do you think of when you see a big white stripe two red stripes and a maple leaf. Some may say it's just the Canadian flag. Some may say it's what you stood up for. Some may say it represents home. But I say it represents hospitality, hard work, and acceptance. As you can tell, I'm speaking to you from an outsider's perspective. Although it has never felt that way. Because when I left my hometown of Portsmouth, England nine years ago, this country brought in me and my family with open arms. Now that brings me to my first point, the pure hospitality of Canadians. The Canadian people have always demonstrated hospitality and a welcoming smile to people. They are always working to make you more comfortable than them, even in difficult times. You will have to go a long way to find a more upright, generous, and decent people than the Canadians. Their kindness is unstoppable. I first encountered this trait when I deplaned in Montreal, Quebec in 2010. I was only seven at the time, 
with my backpack on my back and my Union Jack shirt on. Didn't know where I was, didn't know what I was doing. But as I got off, the pilot said, have a good time, buddy. That was my first encounter with the kindness of Canadians. If ever Canadians need help, it will always be available to them because of their constant aid to everyone else. Let's just take a look at the facts for a moment. Canada is helping so many other countries perform themselves on current military operations alone. <coughs> Operation Carib, to stop illegal trafficking in the Caribbean Ocean. Operation Snow Goose, this is one of Canada's longest running operations abroad. It's dedicated to prevent common conflicts between Greek, Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot groups. It's been ongoing since 1964. Operation Presence Mali. I believe everyone in this room has heard of this on ongoing operation to help the MISM in Mali. Operation Artemis, to help counter terrorism in the Arabian Sea. And Operation Rendersafe, helping defuse World War II bomb remains in Australia. And 28 others around the globe I haven't even mentioned. Secondly, I am brought to my observances of the work ethic of the Canadian people. I have noticed their absolutely relentless perseverance to get where they need to be. Many people will get, have a goal. They will get 95% of the way there, have a bad day, and throw their hands up, it's done. It's quiz. You're having a bad day, not a bad life. Many people think that if you don't succeed at everything in life, that it's sink or swim, and you can't recover. If you present a problem to a Canadian, they will resolve it with the best work ethic you have ever seen. And that will not stop them from getting where they need to be. Canadians are very dedicated to the work they are assigned, even if it's not something they find enjoyable. It will get done because that's how they do things. In this country we call home has worked for everything it has. And Canadians are preserving that hard work to an amazing extent. And furthermore, I believe that the rights and hope for which past Canadians had spilled their blood is not the property of our generation to send, render, and we need to keep it moving. They will accept any and all the people and help that are offered, and it will always be at their disposal. Thirdly, I would like to mention the undiscriminating openness and acceptance of a multicultural country. To them, you're a Canadian, and they will treat you that way. I was born in Britain, and she is always close to my heart, but have always felt viewed and considered in a, as a Canadian. No matter the circumstance, there is no favoritism. As an officer I know well once said to me, the day favoritism comes back here is the day I walk out that door. In Canada, you won't be treated as an immigrant or as a refugee because they understand to you, this is home. And they will never violate that. Because they understand that together we are stronger, together we achieve, and together we are balanced. Canada and its people will always want the best for you. It doesn't matter on where you're from, who you believe in, what you eat, what color you are, if you're a boy or a girl, or who you believe in. I believe in this country so much because of every factor I have mentioned so far. And that is why this is a passionate subject to me. I believe that I speak for every immigrant to Canada when I say thank you. Thank you to Canada and thank you to Canadians. The Canadian people are a well put together, thoughtful, welcoming, dedicated and hard working nation. And remember, nobody is born a warrior. You choose to become one when you refuse to stay seated. Imagine living a life in which you know nothing but pain, surgery, and operating rooms. Although this life may sound like a hell that you wouldn't want to endure, it's a hell that a young girl by the name of Gemma Starks had to. From birth, she was discovered to have a serious, yet rare, life-threatening injury. In simple terms, she was born with only half a heart. With no known solution in sight, 
doctors needed to find a completely new, yet innovative way to operate. And after exhausting all of their known options, they finally turned to the world of 3D printing. It was only through 3D scanning and modeling that they were able to accurately not only design, but physically print out this little girl's heart, thus boosting the success rate of her impending surgery and her chances of her living a normal life. Good evening, honorable judges, guests, and fellow cadets. I am Flight Corporal Heath, and today I would like to speak to you about the impact of 3D printing technology in our future. But before I go into what the future of 3D printing holds, I believe we first need to define what 3D printing is. Well, three-dimensional printing, also known as additive manufacturing, is the process of creating a real-life three-dimensional model from a digital file. This is often done through using a 3D printer. And if used correctly, could allow some everyday people to create some not so everyday things. An ancient philosopher by the name of Confucius once said that the key to understanding our future lies in our past. And the same can be said for 3D printing, with the first working prototypes being built in 1984. They were built by an engineer named Charles Hull. And when they were finished, they completely revolutionized our industrial field. Some often call this moment in time as the new industrial revolution, as parts for machines were suddenly made cheaper, yet more accessible. And through using metallic-based filaments, people were able to print out equally, if not stronger, parts for complex machines. Parts that would otherwise take hours of hard labor or expensive machinery to produce. Not only this, but 3D printing allowed for personalization. Raw, three-dimensional files could be adapted or even suited towards your own needs. And in the industrial field, this meant that less time would be spent on creating new files, mm -hmm. as you could just alter previous designs. And to top it all off, this could all be done from the comfort of your very own homes. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, these were some of the past impacts of 3D printing. So what does this tell us about our future? Well, in 2002, 3D printing finally crossed over into the medical field. The world was taken by storm, as scientists were able to not only culture human cells, but use them to physically 3D print human organs. This was monumental, as it allowed us to further our knowledge on human tissue and potentially save thousands of lives through transplants. In the future, this breakthrough could impact humans in more ways than just one, as wait times in hospitals will be dramatically reduced, allowing critical patients to get the help that they need at a faster rate. Not only this, but transplants will be made safer. Because these organs will be made from your DNA and not somebody else's, the chances of these operations succeeding would rise. But undoubtedly, one of the greatest impacts that 3D printing will have on our future won't happen here on Earth, but rather in space. Popular space corporations such as NASA are opting to bring 3D printers to other planets. If you ask any NASA employee about the most annoying thing with space travel, They'll tell you about the hundreds of pounds of encumbersome gear that they bring along but never use. Spare parts, tools, and gear all fill up valuable space on our space shuttles. So instead of bringing all of these unneeded items into space, corporations are opting to bring machines to make these items. As in the future, 3D printing would allow astronauts to create the gear that they need as they need it, even 
when they're thousands of miles away from home. It's so amazing to think of the many ways that 3D printing has impacted our lives. From medical uses to the new industrial revolution and even helping astronauts to carry lighter loads. This just proves that 3D printing can affect anyone from anywhere, even little girls such as Gemma, who has nothing but love to say for 3D printing. Thank you. Cadets and ex-cadets, do you remember your very first day in cadets? I remember mine. That day as I stood in flight, I saw a strange man marching towards the center of the parade square. He was the definition of an arrow being shot from a bow. As he gave his commands, you could hear his voice echoing off of the walls. I was wondering to myself, how could a guy only a few years older than I am be able to command over such a large crowd of 200 cadets? He was the chief of the squadron, the captain of the sports team, the commander of the drill team, and had both his glider and power pilot licenses. His name is Justin Pimento, and he is my role model. Master of ceremonies, esteemed judges, cadets, coaches, and guests, I have learned three lessons from him. Lesson number one, in order to go big, you must start small. When I was in level one, Pimento taught us a drill lesson one day. As he demonstrated how to march, I couldn't help but stare at his shiny boots. He noticed this and shouted at me. What are you looking at? Stunned, I said, sir, how come your boots are so shiny? With a straight face, he told me, if you want to be a good cadet, start off with polishing your boots first. At the end of the night, Pimento came to me and said, I appreciated your comments. Just remember, if you want to go big, you must start small. I took his words to heart and started with baby steps. I positioned my wedge, rolled lint off of my uniform, polished my boots. In the end, I became the best first year cadet. Lesson number two. In order to achieve your personal goals, you must persevere. Three years ago, I competed in the area biathlon competition. Pimento was also on the team, but he's never skied before. When everyone was, on, was done the race, he was still on the trails. I was getting worried. What has happened to him? Has he fallen down a rabbit hole and found himself in Wonderland? <laughs> Just when we all lost hope, he appeared. Slowly but steadily climbing up the final hill and crossing the finish line. I rushed to him. Good job, sir, but how could a first-timer like you finish such a challenging race? He smiled. I knew I wasn't going to win anything, but my goal was to finish. I tried hard, persevered, and made it. Just remember, if you want to achieve your personal goals, you must persevere. His words stuck with me. A year later in the same competition, I tried hard, persevered, and won a gold medal. Even better, I made it all the way to the National Cadet Biathlon Championships. Lesson number three. In order to be successful, you must discipline yourself. Two years ago, I competed in the Zone Marksmanship competition. This competition was highly stressful and mentally draining, so most of us relaxed by playing cards during the breaks. But, Manto wasn't playing with us. He was doing his homework. I walked to him. Take it easy, sir. Why don't you come play with us? He smiled. I would like to play, but I've got to finish my homework first. See, I want to get into a good university. I have no other choice but to study hard. Just remember, if you want to be successful, you must discipline yourself. His words resonated with me. This 
year, I applied for the Glider Pilot Scholarship. The studying of aviation was incredibly dry, but I did not let that stop me. I worked very hard. I disciplined myself by studying for two hours every single day. In the end, I achieved a 95% on my exam and got accepted onto course. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody needs a role model. I was extremely fortunate to have Pimento as mine. He taught me three important lessons. You must start small to go big. You must persevere to achieve your personal goals. You must discipline yourself to be successful. Pimento left a legacy in my squadron. I want to follow his footsteps and become the chief so that I can pass down the lessons I have learned from him to the next generation of cadets. Together, we will be strong and fly high. Master Sir